All right, so thank you everyone for coming. It's everyone having a great morning? Yes? All right, great. Uh, so this is me uh, with a silly hat. My name is Iran. Um, came from Israel, from Tel Aviv. I work for SNCC it's, uh, as a developer advocate. It is an open source security company trying to make uh, security easier for developers. So it's a developer first uh, tooling. Uh, what we're going to talk about today is integration testing or how to test your APIs between all of those microservices. And basically, just a little bit about me. I'm also uh, doing a lot of work around security. So I'm a member of the Node Foundation, working with a security working group. Uh, had a chance to write a book about Node.js specifically, member of some organizations like JS Heroes, it's a Romanian conference, uh, and a secure developer. So you can find me on all of those medias and talk with me about anything you want from JavaScript, open source testing, uh, or security. So with that said, uh, there we go. So I want to start off with a corny uh, but insightful joke. So there's a QA engineer who walks into a bar, and you know he orders a beer or she, and they order zero beers and 99, 99, nine beers, and then this uh, script alert beer. And this is kind of what I'm trying to say with this is, as I'm sure you're going to see throughout this conference, and you know with your own experience, we're kind of having a lot of different ways of testing our applications, whether it's end-to-end, -end, security testing, um, unit testing, you know, functional. We'll see contract testing today. There's a lot of testing that we're doing to get things you know, in a quality state. And that's kind of the, the thing with like security and everything else. You want to put a lot of layers of you know, safety nets and testing that fits the best model of how you do things. And as I talk about you know, how we do things you know, from a classical approach, uh, if these thing, two things aren't, uh, these two blobs aren't really making an effect for you, uh, it's kind of like the monoliths, right? Like back then we had those, you can exchange, of course, Tomcat with PHP and MySQL with Postgres and anything else. But this is kind of like the monolithic model of what we had before. Um, you know, or I'm saying before, but you know, some people are still working like that and that's not bad. Uh, but that's generally like how things rolled. And it was pretty simple. It was a pretty simple time back then. Uh, getting a new, uh, a new class, you know, a new domain model is just adding it to an existing code base. Testing it is, you know, t it might be, you know, complicated, but it's fairly more simple probably than microservices things or serverless today. I'm going to get to that maybe a bit more. Uh, but generally, like, it was an easy business domain evolution. We wanted to do things. It was pretty straightforward how to bring it up, how to, how to deploy it, how to do all of it or all, all of those things around it related to software development and uh, the life cycle around it. And you know, microservices came along, and you know, I'm saying microservices, but that's kind of like 2015, and everyone are rushing into serverless. I hope, I think, I fear, I don't know. Uh, kind of that's what's what's happening. And microservices, you know, they brought their own goodness, but also a lot of challenges with them. Right? There was orchestration. How do you orchestrate deploying all of those microservices? How do you handle configuration around, you know, deploying different microservices that depend on each other? Uh, so many other things. You know, monitoring is definitely a whole lot of thing that I think we haven't really worked out yet. Um, I think there's some companies doing great stuff there, like Datadog and others. Uh, but generally, like, the whole observability around the whole microservices deployment things, uh, and that's still a struggle. So presumably, this is a picture of uh, uh, Amazon uh, circa, I think, 20, uh, 2007 or 2009. Uh, so how do you test that? How do you know that when something breaks, it doesn't bring down with it a whole lot of things? And generally speaking, in software architecture, right, you have you have uh, methods of control to, to you know, handle that, like circuit breaking and stuff like that, but that doesn't really, you, know, you don't want to get to that point. You probably want to test things before they, they deploy. So brings me into testing and contract testing in general. So let's take a couple of examples of how we, were be, how we would be doing testing in, in some ways. So we have this, uh, you know, this team A, they, they build an API. It has a get stats uh, API endpoint. And one way that they would test it is using mocks, right? Everyone probably familiar with that. It's pretty simple. They go through that whole uh, SDLC process. They build it. They test it. They deploy it. Of course, it's all being tested using mocks. Uh, so they deploy it. Everything is great. Team B does the same thing. At the moment of integration, you know, everything connects together. Things are working well. But the next iteration that team B handles their... Um, uh, their deployment, maybe they have made a mistake. Like they are now returning to, uh, 201 for a post request instead of 200 because someone wants to be more restfulish, which is great per to say, you know, but maybe the API just broke because of that. Uh, so we're getting those problems where using mocks is great. Uh, it has some advantages, but you know, it's not always the best and ideal way to do it. So as we iterate on some of the, of the advantages that it has, we know it's fast, right? It's really fast to, to write a mocking, you know, a unit testing mock uh, uh, code in your test. Uh, 
The other thing is, is it's pretty cheap, right? If you look at, we'll get to the testing pyramid in a second, but if you look at it, it's pretty cheap to run. You can run it locally. Um, it's pretty quick to write it as well. It doesn't involve any, um, any complicated setups or test harness that required to bring these things up. And it is always deterministic. So that's not gonna fail you on some occasions because that's basically just a mock. Downside of that is, as we said, it's not really reliable. It is something that could easily break if production does not meet the expectation of a mock. And I think as we have seen, as, as we know, like as developers, from our experience, when, when teams integrate, whether it's front-end and back-end, or two back-end teams trying to build an API, there's always those, those challenges of, you know, maybe someone misunderstood an API, maybe something was miscommunicated, right? And this is kind of why uh, the pains were, were APIs break. So the other option on that, on that spectrum, probably 180 per, uh, degrees to the other side, is end-to-end -end testing. This is the other option that we have. It looks kind of like this. Um, you build it, right? You test it, but then you, you're, starting think, you're starting to think, well, what do I need to actually test it when I'm doing end-to-end -end testing? So I'm actually calling this Team B API endpoint. Um, I should probably just you know, bring that service up. But Team B actually needs this you know, Redis and cache server, and they need something else for configuration to get things up so that they have like, this staging environment working. And actually, Team B probably depends on Team C for building that API. So things starting to get a bit complicated. And you know, at some point, you know, in my previous company, we were thinking, well, you know, let's put all of it in Docker Compose. You know, we have containers. That's great. We can you know, orchestrate all of it. It's nice. It is not really scalable to that end when you're growing and scaling up. So you have this way of being able to you know, test everything with an end-to-end -end and you deploy it. And you win this reliability and you know, maybe kind of a deterministic thing, not really, not really exactly that because the, the, the API, the versioning can change itself. So like you would be maybe testing an end-to-end an, an -end version of Team B or Team C, but what they have already deployed to production is ahead of it. So it requires a fair bit amount of orchestration and configuration to get that testing environment, even for end-to-end, -end, actually working well. So kind of reliable, uh, cons for it, right? All of these advantages, like it is pretty slow to run end-to-end -end test if you have done that before, like a whole system test, that, that's pretty slow. It's pretty costly because you have to bring up a whole lot of environment. So if you're doing things that are more cloud native, you have to like, you know, spin up some services and that's gonna be a bit more costly. Um, and it's not really scalable as we've seen with the example of, you know, that, that presumably uh, Amazon picture, you're not gonna be able to run all of those, all of those uh, microservices in an end-to-end -end one-time environment for each service for each team. That's gonna be hard. And I put this picture of, of the testing pyramid, this classic one, not because we need to adhere to it and follow it rule by rule, but because it reminds us that as we go up, things you know, have, have disadvantages and advantages, and we need to figure out what fits our model the most. So mocks are end-to-end, are these really only our only choices? Um, maybe not, so let's think about what we should be doing. So as we talked about, this, this example case is gonna talk about specifically APIs to APIs. So microservice to microservice, for example, but of course this relates to microservices uh, to backend testing with frontend or anything else. So you have this request, right? You're basically, you know, this needs to be tested that you're sending the right request, the right query parameters, you're getting back a response, the response HTTP code, you know, the whole thing around the HTTP metadata itself, and the payload needs to, to you know, to supply a specific uh, use case that you want. So actually, this is what, ne this is what needs to be tested. And you know, we call that a contract, right? It very much reminds us a contract. And this is where contract testing begins. This is, this is like the concept that if you hadn't done contract testing before, and this is the first time you hear about it, it's kind of eluded you this whole time because contract testing is pretty beautiful. You get this whole idea of mocks, but someone is tied to this, the other party is tied to enforcing the same, uh, the same contract of the mocks in their builds and their CI. So they can't really break you when they go live. So it's kind of you getting this win or situation of being fast and being deterministic. At the same time, it's, not, it's reliable because no, no one can go into production and break your contract if they are enforced in the same loop. So to do that, you know, we have this uh, pattern called consumer-driven contracts, which is what we're talking about today. And it actually, you know, it's not, it's not really new as well. Right? It's been there for like a decade or more. Uh, I think uh, there's a good uh, post about it on Martin Fowler's blog by Ian. Uh, you should probably read that if you're just getting into it because it's hard to organize things really well for you. Uh, but generally speaking, what I'm going to show you today is how I, how I build this for you know, two different uh, consumer and provider um, 
contract testing applications built in Node.js, and I'm using Pack to do it. It's a very, uh, it's a very feature-rich, very good framework, very mature one as well. Uh, it has language SDKs for different applications, whether you're using Python or Ruby or Java, you're gonna be able to use it. They have a really great community around it and great API documentation. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna be using that one to show you how that works. So contract testing and what this is all about. So you have this consumer, which is basically you know, the one, that, that person that consumes the APIs. You have on the other side a provider. Those are those that are providing the API. Pretty self-explanatory so far. You have the contract itself, which is what they exchange between themselves to get the API going. And there is this concept of a broker, which is where the contract lives. Now, it doesn't, you don't really need to always have a broker, but it really, really helps, and I will tell a bit why around it. But basically, the contract, you can just place it on like an S3 bucket, on an FTP, you know, whatever you really want, as long as you can you know, manage it. Uh, but the broker is really useful. I'm gonna show how useful it is uh, in a bit. So how would, you, how would you approach contract testing in your team? Like, how does that work? So the, first, the very first thing that contract testing says, even it is consumer-driven contract, there is a lot of emphasis on the fact that there's a lot of collaboration. So it's not me as a consumer telling someone else, the provider team, how they should build the API, and I'm not dictating it, and they are not dictating it either on the other side. A lot of collaboration going on and figuring out what really should be built. So we talk, you know, we chat a lot, go to lunch breaks, etc. And then we start, once we have this model of agreement of what we decided, the consumer side is working on writing their, their contract tests. So they are actually building tests around the, 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 that API client that they just wrote to, to integrate. As they're building it, they're gonna get a contract out of it. So the beautiful thing with this packed framework is when, you are building, when you're writing your test and you're running it, the output of that is an actual contract. You don't need to like write the contract manually. You just write the test as you would write anything else. Once you're done writing the, the contract test, you push the contract to your broker. That's the home of where all the contracts live, and you know, they have this metadata of what is the consumer, what is the provider, what is the version, and all of it, all of those around it. As the provider progresses, and you know, they have time, they have this sprint now ticket that they are able to implement this contract for you. You would go ahead, uh, they would go ahead and create, you know, implement the actual contract. So they would go ahead and, you know, they have this amazing API endpoint and they would integrate it and run it into their code. To be able to test that they have actually done something, you know, well in the expectations of the contract with the consumer, their CI, their build system, you know, whatever you're running there is going to be able to go through that process of downloading the contract that the consumer pushed into the broker and they're gonna run those tests against their actual API code and test that it actually enforces the contract itself, right? So this, if this breaks, then maybe there, there's two, two possibilities, right? If this breaks, either the provider did not implement it the right way or the consumer didn't get it the way that they should have. But at that point, they already know that something broke before going into production, before merging that pull request. So they download the contract, run their testing, and you know, when that done and everything works, you know, everyone are happy remember this part in their day job where everyone are happy. <laughs> yeah, software development is uh, <laughs> it's tricky. So um, let's build something, right? Let's, let's put this into code and, and show you how this thing works. So we're gonna build UMDB. It's, uh, it's not IMDB, it's UMDB. It is going to be based on you know, uh, augmented reality, virtual reality, I just made it up. Reality, blockchain, serverless, a lot of technologies. And because we are all really great senior developers here, we're gonna use a lot of microservices to do that. Yep, a lot of them, even that one at the end, yeah. Great, so UMDB is gonna be based on something like a movies and a review. It's gonna have two teams, and one is the consumer, one is the provider. To do that, and to imagine what that might look like, the consumer side, the movies, is gonna be able to provide an API that when it's being called, it's gonna present this data like movie ID name, and then it has this uh, metrics like total reviews and average rating. So how it's gonna get it? That's right, it's gonna make an API call to reviews and get this, this data back. This is where we have our API integration testing coming in. So how does consumer testing looks like? Because we're talking about consumer-driven contracts and consumers are gonna do this. So um, all of these examples are JavaScript and Node.js, but fairly simple to illustrate what's going on. So obviously when I'm, when I'm writing that, uh, that API client to integrate with, uh, with my provider, which I'm hoping that you know, no one does straight up in a, in a controller or something like that because then you can't really test it. So when I have this reviews client here, basically very, uh, uh, very simple, makes a request, uh, takes a response back, maybe just massages the data a little bit to uh, make it uh, good for the consumer part in the consumer code. And that's great, but how do we test that? So 
kind of conservative ways of testing it is, you know, you would unit test it, unit test the data, feed it some mock data. Maybe you would actually like mock the entire request itself, not even let it go out. Maybe you would put something out like knock in the Node.js and JavaScript world to get a request and reply it back. So this is the conservative ways of doing that. How would we do it with contract testing? So pretty simple. We start off by importing the reviews client as we need it for the test itself. And we take this packed uh, framework um, uh, instantiator like this class that we need to, to bring up everything else. So first off, we are going to declare what are we testing? Who is the consumer? Who is the provider? Uh, you know, some ports and some metadata that is required to help you get this going. And then you spin it up. So what do you actually spin up in this point is you actually spin up the, the uh, like a semi-provider, that's like a simulation, that's an actual HTTP service. An actual HTTP service call is gonna go out and send this and send you know back data, but what data is gonna be sent back? So this is where the beauty of contract testing comes in. You are able to define those interactions and expectations and set what exactly is supposed to get back for you. So these tests you know, should receive more statistics for specified uh, movies. Uh, this specific test case would, would define an interaction. You know, For example, has, uh, it, the provider needs to go into a state that says, you know, that has review statistics for a movie. Uh, the expected request payload is gonna be something like you know, a get request with specific headers or your query parameters or whatever you need to send it. And you're gonna say, you know, this is what I'm expecting for you to respond back. I want to get you know, the status 200 and you know, whatever else you also need to get her. Uh, what's really interesting here is um, as we get to the specifics and details of contract testing is you can use matchers. So you do not need to provide, it's probably a bad practice to actually, you know, say ID 200 or ID, you know, something else, you would provide type matching. So it would make it easy to test and for the provider side as well, easy to actually spin up data to, to actually do the contract testing on their side. So you have all of this from the packed framework and you're basically, if you look at it, it is kind of like doing either sign on or, or knock testing from the JavaScript world and it's the same probably for every other uh, language and, and test framework because you have to set the mock you know, before and then you, you make the request and uh, assert that everything works. So this is kind of the same thing. At that end, when you have, test, when you have set out the expectations uh, for the contract, you make a call just like any other call that you would make, you, know, you can assert the logic itself and at the end of it, just verify the actual um, contract testing from the consumer side and, uh, and the provider side, which for this case is the packed framework, uh, has worked well. So this is the contract testing from the consumer side. And before I move to the other part of it, as, as, you, think, as, you, as you see it by now, if you think about it, nothing has changed for consumers. So for consumers, from my perspective, when I talk about it a lot and I do a lot of these workshops, people always see that as consumers, it's basically a win-win situation because you're getting the whole world of benefits from contract testing, but your, your, contr your actual contract testing from code perspective remains the same. You have not you know, increased, um, increased the complexity of writing tests because it's kind of like the same workflows that you have done so far. So this runs, this is great. Uh, some consumer guidelines for you when you are building this. Um, so interactions are in test cases and not before. So like not having the interaction in a before or an after, as that's really important to be able to have atomic tests. Um, you know, consider using factories for interactions because I've, as you've seen, the consumer um, the consumer declaration for the interaction itself could be pretty big. You know, as you have more and more of those APIs in, in files, it could actually be uh, you know, very, very big and very repetitive. So a good idea is to go ahead and have factories that will return those interactions. Avoid random data in expectations. That's kind of a golden rule for testing in general, but definitely for, uh, for packed as well and for consumer-driven contracts because it, there's, there's a lot of mechanics of how uh, Pact is able to cache your contract and you know it, it uh, has checksums around it, et cetera. So if you add random data, it's gonna, it's gonna go ahead and change it every time. So that's golden rule for testing as well as for contract testing too. Um, matching types instead of actual data, which is what we said before why that is so useful. And the whole part of you know, do not tempt into doing functional end-to-end -end tests with your contract testing. As in test the contract, do not go ahead and try with the contract test themselves to drive into workflows you know, and then specific scenarios of, of you know, testing the business logic of your end-to-end -end side. Because that's not what you want to do. You want to trust the other party, the provider, that they are actually doing those contract testing on their side as well. So a response uh, contract looks like this. It has a response. Uh, there's not a lot to, you know, to say about a contract since that's pretty, uh, pretty uh, simple. There's just a response, uh, a request going out, consumer provider. Um, I, would, I will say and mention you know, Postal's law, which is basically, um, if you're doing a lot of API uh, testing and stuff, uh, that basically means you know, being conservative on what you send 
uh, and being liberal on what you receive. So for example, if a provider is now sending you a new field called, uh, you know, first name, whatever tag, you know, and you did not expect that, that should not really break it unless, you know, they actually change something. If they added new fields, that's okay. So this is kind of the whole Postal's law around um, API testing in general. And, you know, it's pretty simple. It's a JSON output. You can put the contract as YAMLs if that's more to your liking, but this is how it looks like. This is the end contract, right? It's not some magic. It's really just a contract. The packed broker on the other side is able to store all of this data. So like I said before, you can put it basically anywhere you want. You can commit it to Git, be old school and commit it to an FTP and someone downloads it from the FTP. But generally, if you have this home that everyone uh, you know, go to and interact with and get a contract, it's actually really interesting to get some details around it, some analytics. So for example, if I have this, this is how the packed broker looks like, it's kind of, I think that's a bit of an older uh, date of, uh, version of that. Uh, they have revamped it a bit. Uh, but it's pretty interesting like from what you can see here. So first of all, I can see when I as a consumer you know, last published it and it, has it been verified and, and when has it been verified by your provider. So I have all of this data. I can go ahead and you know, take a look on this verification status, but I can also, you know, they have this uh, uh, help provider that can go in and actually interact with the contract. So it's kind of like an interactive swagger thing that you can, that you can use to test it. And while not, not shown here, but it has this version matrix. So you can easily go in and see between the consumer and a provider, two versions of a contract, which, which version is compatible for that specific one. So if provider B is now deployed with version one and then two and then three, and they all, verif and they all like uh, uh, complement the same contract version, you can easily see that. This is truly helpful because if you need to roll back from a provider deployed version from version three to version two, you can generally easily figure out if that's gonna be something that breaks an API for a client or not. That's truly useful. Um, provider side testing is where things get a bit interesting. I think, for, like I said before, for consumers, it is rather easy um, and straightforward to, to go through this workflow. For provider, it's, there's a bit of heavy lifting and I'm show you, gonna show you how that looks like. So the provider contract testing, the provider side of this, um, and when we have done that before in my, in my company, we've done a Node.js consumer and a Java provider, but that's again, just a language uh, semantics here. It is as simple as it looks here, uh, except for one thing. So when the provider needs to, to you know, build the contracts, what they actually need to do is they, they specify who is the consumer, right? So all of this metadata, like the provider base URL, where to get, uh, where, like where do they need to ping in the HTTP endpoint, where do they get the contract from, what tags of a contract they need to get as that is also supported, you know, how to connect to the broker to download the contract and all of those things. And to start verifying it, you just, you know, run this uh, verify provider. Now what this does is basically start everything up and, you know, and get the provider to spin up, get requests, and as it gets requests from like a packed runner that simulates a client based on the contract that exists, the provider is actually, it's, it's kind of like an end to end for the provider, right? The provider is actually up and running with the database, whatever it needs and replying back with data. So the way that uh, we need to make it work is we need states because for example, if you have a test, a test case for a contract that says, you know, I have no reviews or I have no stats or I have 50 stats, you need to, you need the provider at that point when it gets those requests from the, from the packed consumer contract, it actually needs to reply back and, you know, and, and provide this data because it's going to assert uh, for it. So you have to have this state management, and this is kind of the heavy lifting that exists for provider. This is where things for providers get a bit, a bit um, uh, tricky, but it, there are some guidelines to make it work. So the state management thing for, for, for the provider looks like this. You define uh, an endpoint, like for example, slash setup, which is of course only used for this testing uh, episode. And it's gonna, get, uh, it's gonna get like a post request, it's gonna get uh, the actual state that the provider needs to go into. So if you remember when we were doing consumer testing, we actually had a state, like the state was, has 50 uh, uh, stats reviews or has none reviews. And then I will know to you know, assert that I'm getting a 400 response or something like that or a 404 or whatever. So here I'm having this, uh, having this uh, simple switch case, right? It's really just for the example, you should not be using uh, actual switch cases like that. But it has this example of when I'm, when I'm getting this request that needs to go into a state that has no statistic, I have this helper utility, it's kind of seed database, that I can go in and actually re re remove and delete all of the database, all of the tables or entries that I have. So I can actually really reply with this actual logic of, you know, uh, of I will have nothing in my database and I will reply with, you know, 404 or whatever I need to do. 
So this is the actual heavy lifting of the state management for provider testing. And this is how we do it. So think about it. The request goes in to get slash stats. You need to reply back. Sorry. You need to reply back with a 200 OK. How does all of that work when you're doing provider testing? The provider as the reviews it starts the API service. So the API service goes up. API service uh, creates an endpoint called slash setup where it's able to get all of those state management requests to put it into a state. The packed framework, uh, again, this is just a provider service, yes, and the, and the packed framework. So no consumer involved here. The packed framework is going to go up, going to go through the contracts, and as it goes one by one, it's going to go and send this post request into slash setup, which is our state management, and it's going to tell it, you know, bring it into a specific state, for example, has no, uh, has no stats. At that point, you know, it's going to get hopefully a 200 OK, like everything is OK. And then the packed framework is going to go through a contract uh, route specifically, like an actual interaction, and make that request. So it's going to simulate as if it was the consumer. As it gets something back, you know, everything is OK. Everyone are happy. So some bad practices um, <laughs> in general around contract testing as we're uh, close to wrapping up. Uh, don't test provider business logic in your consumer test. This is not required for that. Provider testing, the provider itself, as in whatever test they will have in their unit test, in their business logic, that will already cover that. You do not need to go into this, and this is something that usually teams tempt into doing. Using Pact as a mock service is, is not by itself you know, a bad practice in terms of it, it will just not probably give you anything m much better than having you know, NOC or something else. So if you're using Pact as a framework and you're not, use, and you're not doing the whole contract testing, that's nice, but that's, you're, you're losing the whole idea of contract testing. And contract testing for public APIs is probably not something that you want to do since no one else, as in Google, Facebook, whatever, they're not going to go and you know, cons uh, verify your, uh, your testing, so that doesn't make sense. Benefits of, of contract testing, right? Consumer-driven contracts. So first of all, if you think about it, there's waste reduction. I've been in teams that had the slash segments endpoint and slash segments all and slash segment. And like all of those different endpoints, they all bring the same data. It's just that one team built that, the other team replaced it. You know, they built something else because they have no idea what the other thing did. And then you end up having 50 APIs, one consumer for, for each of them. They're all kind of do, hitting the same logic endpoint and doing pretty much the same thing. When you're doing consumer-driven contracts, you're actually going from a business perspective, from a need perspective of the consumer side of what you actually need to build. You, be, you win both confidence and speed because for the consumer and the provider, you basically do not bring a whole end-to-end -end system you know, for everything, it's just for the specific cases. For consumer side, it's even not an end-to-end, -end. It's, it's, a, it's a unit testing uh, exercise. And you get this true release independence because you can really release both of them in, 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 in different ways, not just API versioning, but in the fact that you can actually go with a contract testing for something that hasn't even been built yet, make sure that you know, provider team implements it, make sure that they actually uh, provide actual API around it, and then release it when you need to. So this is all. I'm going to get some questions if we have, because I know I think we're a bit out of time. But this is consumer-driven contract. If you have any questions, I'm here. Oh, we have a question. Great. Fantastic. Thanks. Thank you, Lirian. Hello, Liran, and hey. thanks for, for your talk. It was great, sure. uh, and it is great. Uh, my question is about integrating the PACT framework into your CI process. Mm. How do you do that, and how do you make sure that both parties have run that PACT, and like how, how the control happens? It's a great question. I have, uh, have a good article for that. So uh, there is a way to basically go ahead and... Probably gonna send you this one, but but I have a whole uh, diagram of how to how to do that. In terms of, and you're right, this is a great question because the CI part when I when I did this whole POC and I integrated that into the company in our in our in our workplace, the CI part was the thing that took the most time, right? You had to how to handle the whole uh, DevOps uh, perspective for it. So I'm gonna send this out uh, after this talk, and it's just not something as as small to talk about because there's the whole. As we get to it, no, but but this is what I'm actually saying. There's this whole workflow of how the CI integrates. What is the workflow? How do you do that? And what is ultimately really important this whole process is actually how to build this whole thing called the Pact Manifest, which is 
what you need in order if you have two different teams that have a different way of, of deploying, like one is doing a CI CD every commit is into production, the other one is deploying every two weeks, you're always gonna be behind. And what a packed frameworks uh, follows is you, you need to have two feature branches on, on, two, on the consumer and provider, and they are kind of connected by like naming conventions and stuff, and only when two of them gets, gets merged, then the actual contract is, is valid and deployed. And I didn't want to do that because I did not want to have like those long-running, uh, long-lived branches, and I wanted to do this whole CICD process. So this whole thing talks about tagging a contract, so I can tag it as like develop, you know, push it into the CI using a, using a using a, a develop tag, and it's not enforced into production, so the CI on the provider will not fail because that hasn't been tagged as, as a production ready. When they have deployed, when everything has been okay, they will tag it as production, and then when their CI will run, and if they actually broke the contract, they will actually fail. Uh, so there is this whole provider DevOps pipeline and consumer DevOps pipeline. It's just a bit more of an elaborate uh, question to, to answer right now, but I'm gonna send you this link afterwards or just you know on Twitter or something, I'll share the slides, and we can have more discussions around it. Sure. We have time for one more question. Hi, thanks for your talk. Uh, sure. How would you compare uh, PACT with uh, Postman for contract testing? Hmm. It's a good question since I haven't used Postman for contract testing, just for my own uh, uh, API uh, ad hoc testing. So I don't really have an example. For, I don't know if they're doing contract testing. Um, if, if there's no con a context of, con of contract testing, then it's a whole different thing. Um, it's you know just an API play play uh, play around thing and in fact is like an actual framework that provides you all of these things that you can bring build around it especially the devops pipeline perspective that actually really enforces the fact that you have this so i'm giving this talk after uh, running this pilot in a previous company a very uh, uh, engineering organized uh, reach organization uh, we run it for uh, about a year or something as, as a proof of concept with both Node and Java, and I've seen really good success in terms of teams actually building their APIs with contract testing, and you know then uh, evolving this into like a front end and a back end, which is always even for the same team. For my team, it's been also a case where we sometimes broke APIs because of misunderstanding, and this is what it brings around it. So, thank you. Uh, I 